Hi, my name is Debbie Forster and I'm the CEO of the Tech Talent Charter. I really am pleased to welcome you to our first Tech Talent Charter Flexi Festival. This is our third morning coffee. I'm bringing out the big guns today because it's been an exciting but full week. Um, it's lovely to have everyone join us. Um, I wish I could have you in the room. I prefer it uh, when we can all see each other. But uh, so normally, if we were all in the same room, I would be giving you the exciting, if there's a fire alarm, this is what you need to do, etc. Instead, I'm going to do give you some instructions about what's here on the screen. If you've been in several times, I now I'm just gonna be that, that white noise. That's the flight attendant telling you about the exits on the side, etc. So if you're new, uh, this screen is where you're going to see and hear us. We do want conversation. So if you scroll down just a little bit, you will see two tabs. One of those tabs is for Q&A. And we do have a great panel coming up and we'd love you to generate some questions for us. The other is for polls because we want information from you. And I've already got one there for you that I'd really like you to give us some feedback because we're always trying to understand what's happening in the space. So you'll see in the poll today that we're asking you about if you already are having alternate routes into tech programs going on in your company. You'll hear in a few moments that we'll be referring to things like our annual report. We'll be talking about our open playbook. If you've not seen this before, we'd love for you to use that. If you cursor further down, you'll see things on our toolkit where you can download the resources. As I'm talking in a few moments, I'm gonna talk about our last two sessions. If as I'm talking about that, you think, my goodness, why haven't I signed up for that? I really wanna be in that session. There's still time. If you curse it down, you'll see the rest of the agenda for today and how you can sign up to join. A few of you who are here are, are newcomers to us. Many of you are signatories. It's lovely to have you here. If you've not yet joined the Tech Talent Charter, it is free to join, and it's a place where anyone in the ecosystem, employers, providers, people who are working with underrepresented groups in tech, can come together to connect the dots to really move the dial on diversity in tech. Have a look below and you can join. And finally, at the bottom of the page, you'll see our sponsors. Joining the Tech Talent Charter is free, and everything that we offer our members is free. One of the ways that we can do that is through the generous support of our sponsors, which you'll see at the bottom here today. So across this week, we launched our annual report, um, as, as we always do, because one of the prices you do pay to be the Tech Talent Charter is that you share your data with us. And there were some great headlines but what we wanted to do across these three days, you'll see the theme was difficult conversations and meaningful action together. And this is important if we're going to move the dial. If you've joined us for these discussions, you'll have heard how we are looking to move the conversation on. We used to just have to work to get people to talk about diversity which is just counting who's in the room. But that's just the starting point. What we've enjoyed doing is watching our employers, watching our members take that journey to inclusion, to making sure that people have a culture that they, they can be part of. But what we're talking about from 2021 is the next important leap. And that has to be about belonging. That has to be about looking at things like equity on how we remove the barriers, how we put the support so that everyone knows and feels that they have a place in that room. You'll have heard that we have talked about this is more than gender. We always started with gender, but with the pledge to move further. And we've seen that happen since 2019 onwards. And you'll have heard if you joined our discussions yesterday, how employers are beginning to look at things like ethnicity, how to think about social mobility. You've heard from some of our speakers in Fireside, what are we doing about disability, LGBTQ? And you'll also have heard the running thread throughout this data. We have to know where we are. We have to measure what we're doing, what's working and what's not. But that data is not just getting your numerical data, which is important. It's also that qualitative data. We have to talk to people. We have to understand their experience if we're going to truly build those inclusive pieces. The last thing that we began talking about this week, and we've known about this for several years, is that there, it's, it's fantastic, and we'll talk about in session three today, that we need to think about what's happening in schools, we need to understand what's happening in universities, we need to really look at how we can upskill 
the whole of the digital workforce, but that's not going to be enough. Just getting your culture and recruitment perfect isn't, per, isn't the way forward. I saw in the news yesterday that we are the one sector, tech, that had growth last year in 2020. We saw, real, uh, we saw a real terms growth in the number of jobs that were advertised in tech. And if I remember correctly, before COVID, we didn't have enough talent. So the next thing that we'll be talking about today, and let's look at what we're talking about today, is going to be around alternate routes into tech. Now, if you've been part of the Tech Talent Charter for some time, you know this is game changing. You know this is the way forward because it's only by reaching out to those people who didn't make it into tech on that first time through schools, through universities come through. I am pleased to see we're seeing steady and now growth accelerating in this perspective. What we found in 2020 is one and a half times more of our 500 signatories are now reporting that they're offering these programs. Now, if you say that, if we build it, do they come? Another positive stat that we had coming out of our report was the fact that women are interested, underrepresented groups are interested. And what was interesting is that half of the respondents, when we did a survey in women, said the key to convincing them would be if women had more knowledge of or training and tech. And one in four women who are not in tech told us if there was tech skills training, they would consider switching careers in tech. Now, if this idea of how do we find the people and you wanna hear the voices of those women, do remember to join us for our working lunch today where you will hear from a range of women and how they found their way into tech. And then you'll hear if you also will often refer to our open playbook. If you are new to this space, as well as tuning in for sessions like today, you don't have to start from scratch. In our free open playbook, we do have resources where you can look, see, and get the best ideas of how employers are really making that drive into tech and creating those alternate routes. But that's really what we're here today. So what I'd like to do is now to hand over to Rebecca, one of my about how can employers offer alternate routes into tech? Thank you very much, Debbie, and good morning to everyone um, and a very warm welcome to our fantastic panel who are joining us here this morning for our morning coffee. Um, as Debbie said, my name is Rebecca Donnelly and I have the absolute privilege of being a director at the Tech Talent Charter um, and in my time off from that, a senior partner at Taito PR. Um, so before we kick off this morning, um, just a quick reminder for everyone watching that we would love to hear your comments and feedback on what you hear this morning. So please do help us keep the uh, conversation going on social media um, using the hashtag TTC2021. Um, and please do tag us at Tech Charter UK. Um, also, please do post your questions to the Q&A below and we'll try and get to as many of them as possible. So we're very excited to be joined by an incredible panel this morning. Um, we have a group of leaders who have been innovating and delivering different kinds of talent programs to help create alternative routes into tech, either within their own organizations or through working with others. So we're gonna hear from them this morning on how they've approached this, what's worked, what some of the challenges have been and what their advice is that the wider industry can really take and build on. Um, so I'd like to start by just asking our panel to really briefly introduce themselves um, and then we will um, get on with it. Um, so Andrew, could I come to you first, please? Of course. Thank you and good morning. Um, yeah, I'm Andrew Owich. I'm the head of Apprenticeship Solutions at QA Limited, working with some of the, the larger employers in the country, implement apprenticeship and training strategies to, to help support existing employees and new hires into their business. Thank you very much. Um, Dan, I'll come to you next. Good morning, team. So I'm Ben Murkowski, Chief Design Officer at Lloyd's Banking Group. And as you might tell from my accent, I'm actually American. I'm a designer. I spent the last 10 years in Silicon Valley at Google and Microsoft and um, lead a team that's very diverse, embedded within tech, trying to bring humanity into this space. Thank you. Um, Gemma, please introduce yourself. Oh. Apologies, having a slight connection problems with Gemma. So I will come to Anthony next, if I can. Hi, uh, morning, everybody. So my name is Anthony Walker. I'm Deputy CEO at Tech UK. Uh, we're the trade association representing the technology sector. 
Um, and, and obviously skills and talents and diversity is one of our number one issues as an organization. And uh, we're a very proud sponsor of the Tech Talent Charter. Thank you very much. And I think we should have um, Kirsty Keck from Nationwide with us. Kirsty. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I've had a few tech issues this morning, but I think I am with you. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I am a strategic uh, business uh, director uh, for change at Nationwide uh, and have been involved in the tech charter since its inception. I'm really, um, really pleased to be here again to share some of the things that we've been working on at, uh, at Nationwide and um, inclusion and diversity is very much connected uh, to, to our purpose in terms of mutuality. So looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Kirsty. And we were hoping to be joined by Gemma Wilman from the NatWest group. Um, we, will, we will crack on without her and hopefully she will be able to join us quite shortly. Um, brilliant. Well, Andrew, if it's okay with you, I'm going to come back to you because um, you work with a lot of different companies on a range of programs to, to get people into tech. Um, before we start looking at some of the really specific examples of the great programs the rest of the panel have been working on, from your experience, if I'm new to this, if my company wants to start exploring how we can create uh, new opportunities for people to get into tech, where should they start? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question that we get asked a lot, actually. And I think fundamentally it's, it's a, it requires a real shift in mindset because it's not in the first instance really about the training itself and it's about the different programs. It's, it's around employee well-being. It's about creating the needs of the future that an organization is going to need. And, and that requires a shift because it stops it being a transactional relationship with a provider to buy a program or to buy digital content that's going to give immediate results. It, it needs an investment in people that requires a much longer term view. And, and that's quite hard to achieve for a lot of organizations because to do that effectively, you need to create an arena of psychological safety that enables employees to make mistakes and then to learn from them. So it's thinking about the infrastructure to support those individuals progress in their careers um, through training as a medium. Um, and then about creating the, the support mechanisms they need in the workplace to support them alongside the training. Uh, and it's even more important to consider, I think, when you're looking at at younger individuals, people moving into tech for the first time, um, or people with learning um, and, and health considerations that also need to be factored in. So, you know, for, for an organization to really implement successful programs, they often first need to look at how their organization is set up. What are their, their longer term ambitions? And I think we've seen employers really successfully use apprenticeships to do this um, because they provide that overarching framework uh, that, that provides the sort of structure that an individual needs in order to progress through learning and continual development. So you, you essentially use programs to unlock ambition on an individual basis as a means of crafting organizational culture um, to, to showcase learning and development. I think that's, that's really where an organization needs to begin to, to generate the desire um, to prepare for the future on an individual basis to create organizational impact so that training becomes part of the the overarching kind of core strategy and at that point you start then looking at the programs that might be suitable on a on a per learner or on an individual basis and and for existing employees that's probably slightly different than for new hires which is largely impacted by recruitment practices and um, so so yeah once you've kind of got the organizational aims it's then around speaking to your employees and understanding their capabilities and their desires to learn so that you can then bring the right programs in to support them on an individual basis. Have you seen any specific examples of you know, great work that's been done by companies you've worked with um, in terms of getting that structure and that culture right or any kind of pitfalls for them to watch out for? Yeah, I, I think overall there is an expectation all of a sudden that line managers are going to become mentors and guidance counsellors and, and support structures and they'll fill in this all-encompassing role at the same time as doing the job they've always done and been expected to do and 
And that's really tough. It's a really tough ask to ask a line manager suddenly to take on elements of pastoral care and, and support that they've never had to do before to complete the aims and targets of their job. So where we've seen this work really, really well with employers is those that invest in creating either a central service function or a, an individual um, team that will support the apprentices and learners on program outside of their day-to-day -day duties. So those mentorship programs or the counselor programs are, are the ones that have long lasting effect and help the learner get exposure to the wider business and start to understand how they fit in. Because it's not just about individual training. It's not just about enhancing capabilities. It's about creating the desire to progress and move forward. Um, so, so yeah, I think thought in, in infrastructure and where it works well is, is where that's in place and where it's alongside traditional line management duties. Fantastic. So really looking at the ask and the impact on your existing team as, as well as what you're doing to try and grow it. Um, you talked about apprenticeships there and also training. And Dan, this is something you've been doing a lot of at Lloyd's Banking Group. Can you tell us about your most successful programme and, and why, why and maybe some of the challenges you faced? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the energy that comes in those who are so passionate about tech and design uh, far outweigh any of the concerns that organizations sometimes have in um, having a more inspired way of, of thinking about growing talent. So I mean, two examples, when I joined a couple of years ago, we had um, a couple of individuals reached out and said, you know, one actually had a background in fashion design and said, well, I really want to understand how to do user experience design. What are the pathways in? And so we a, a program to come in. We worked with General Assembly with someone else to have them go through uh, a program to get those skills that they needed. Uh, we've had returnships, which are wonderful. Um, I think the whole notion of our career being one that can accept the beautiful humanity of life with family and kids, et cetera. Um, we had uh, that the last year, uh, very successful, 70% actually of the cohort were also black and Asian colleagues, just wonderful way to, to shift the, the mechanics of, of diversity. And, um, and the last thing I'll just say is we, ha we have to think about tech more broadly as well. And when we think about uh, apprenticeships and returnships, um, we have to start recognizing that there are a lot of skills needed in tech. You know, I'm a designer. My wife is a research scientist. My daughter's a math physicist, but none of them are in tech. So we, we often get too STEM focused. And the reality is there's lots of roles when it comes to backgrounds in design and strategy and other bits that, that help to give purpose and humanize technology. So looking at your last point you made there about um, looking beyond just tech and not being too STEM focused, um, how how have you overcome that issue you know, within within Lloyd's and, and and what advice might you have uh, to other other organisations looking to try and do the same thing? Yeah, well, I think it's a well, it's an interesting space, technology, isn't it? And I think um, like any part of business, if we get too focused on just the technical capability coding part, we often forget that tech is really just a tool; it's an enabler. And we need to bring in other ways of thinking to make sure that tech is used for purpose. For example, on the team, we have 12 different guilds within design. We have individuals who have studied anthropology and psychology who do this role called design research. And they're helping to understand the people who use um, the products and services that tech powers. And none of them really code, but they're understanding how do we connect tech to people's lives. We have another guild called conversation design, which are essential because particularly in banking, a lot of the things that you interact with is text. It's the written mm -hmm. word. And so how do we bring the skills of writers and editors into, uh, into our world? Um, and I think it kind of works both ways. So for example, when we, um, uh, Breakthrough Network, which is elevating the status of women within Lloyd's and in the career, they hosted an introduction to coding session, and over a thousand women signed up for that uh, for that introduction. And then we had a pretty significant group follow on to do a six month coach to coding program. 
that uh, helped to deepen technical skills for women within lawyers who didn't have that background. And so it works both ways. When you bring folks into tech and into the more technical aspects who don't, you know, maybe didn't take computer science or follow that traditional path, they bring such a richness of perspective. And when you bring in anthropologists, writers, visual designers into the world, a lot of people don't think that there's those pathways in. So I think you kind of, both of those sides kind of balance out and try to make tech a more human and creative place. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important point. You know, we all work in tech, right? So it's very uh, easy to forget that for people who perhaps don't consider themselves to, to be technical or technically minded, um, there is this huge skills crossover. And as you say, um, borrowing from one or the other, understanding how non-tech skills and tech skills affect each other allows you to think that much, much more holistically. Um, Kirsty, I know that... Um, you have been uh, leading the Star Tech program um, at Nationwide. Can you tell us a little bit more about, about how that's gone and what some of your key, pro key learnings have been? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so just going back to something that um, Andrew mentioned actually in his uh, opening, I think, um, and I think being here a year ago, we were talking about um, inclusion and diversity really being kind of central to everything that we do. And that is particularly important and nationwide and so whilst we're talking about kind of retraining reskilling um returners today it is very much um ind is something that's very much being built into everything we do at nationwide so we know that um you know one particular program isn't going to you know deliver everything um that we aspire or that we have the ambition to achieve um at nationwide so it's it's such a kind of systemic um uh, aspiration for us that we really are building it into everything that we do um, and then coming on to some of the uh, success that we've had um, we had the pleasure of partnering um, with Andrew and QA um, in 2020 to launch the program that you've uh, mentioned around encouraging and enabling um, some of our colleagues at Nationwide to look at how they could retrain and reskill themselves into um, some of the tech roles that we have. Um, the program that we uh, initially designed was to run alongside people's day jobs. So um, as we've already mentioned, there may be individuals that aspire, um, have interest or curiosity into moving into a more tech based role. And the program was really designed to give them a taster uh, and some sense of what that role and those skills might be like. So very much um, driven around talent and potential to do a role as, as opposed to individuals going into the programme um, with uh, prerequisites around tech skills or tech capability. So it really much was a, was a kind of opening into getting into, uh, getting into tech. And um, it did attract a large range of um, our colleagues and diverse uh, applicants as well. And when we ran the programme last year, um, it was 12 weeks and it did run alongside individuals' day jobs. So the, the positivity around the programme was, was that it didn't ask individuals to give up the job that they were doing today. But it really was an opportunity to learn more, to grow, to really have a taste maybe of a role that they might wish to pursue uh, in earnest moving forward. So the partnership with QA was around the educational aspects of the program and it ran for 12 weeks and the sessions were uh, originally instructor led there was group work so that very much played into um, kind of building confidence building network around um, those those individuals in the cohort um, and there was also digital uh, learning content as well um, and as those individuals graduate they they have had the opportunity in any event to increase the tech skills that they have it has helped us as a business in terms of um, those individuals growing but it also enables them to have a choice now around any roles that they may wish to pursue moving forward so they may not end up in a tech role in its purest sense but it certainly would have enabled um, individuals in the organization to really grow and prosper and learn more um, about tech skills which ultimately um, is really at the forefront of all of our roles as the world and as our business evolves. Um, 
And the success we've seen, I mean, we've, you know, we, we, we've obviously read the Tech Talent Charter report. We're very much in a position where we're looking to increase um, diversity uh, within our tech roles. And we're really pleased in terms of applicants and moves that we're having um, across some of the diversity characteristics. I think we've learned some along the way um, from the programme, but we are very much looking forward to um, April when we're going to launch our next cohort. And we're actually going to run four programmes throughout the next 12 months um, of around 20, 25 individuals in the business. So there'll be 100, uh, 100 colleagues actually running through the programme over the next 12 months. Um, the pandemic brought some opportunities in terms of how the learning was delivered. So all kind of virtual. It does mean that any colleague nationwide, wherever their location is, now has the opportunity um, to have a, a career in technology. So it doesn't matter where you are uh, in the country, in the organisation, you can very much learn and learn, learn online, learn virtually and take, take the opportunity for, uh, for a career in, uh, in tech. Um, the course now, we've reduced it from 12 weeks to six to eight weeks. Um, and some of the things that Andrew already mentioned around the kind of pastoral care aspects, but also the confidence for individuals to really step out and try something different, I think was a, a lesson for us around how you build that confidence, how you really encourage people to, to sort of take that step into potentially what could be or might be a really different role or different set of skills that they're looking um, to develop. Um, thank you. I, I'd love to ask a little bit more about that, if, if that's OK. I, um, I loved hearing what you were saying about um, enabling people to learn skills alongside their day job and, and not necessarily with the expectation that they would transition into a tech role, but really just to give them those extra skills and, and help them um, have more choice. You, you've obviously decided to do it again and you mentioned a, a couple of your learnings, but are there perhaps two or three specific things that you've learned from the first round that you're bringing into, into the second round that, that might help the audience listening if they're thinking about doing something similar? Yeah, I think, um, look, I think the um, the original course ran alongside the day job, but the learning was um, often, uh, particularly with the instructor-led training um, pursued in the day. And I think that colleagues, it did have an impact in terms of colleagues being able to undertake the learning as well as as their day job. And that's that's not easy. I think, you know, positive intent, but sometimes the impact slightly different. Um, so we are looking to um, run the instructor led sessions in the evenings to lessen the impact, which, you know, clearly it does mean that people are putting in um, time towards the end of the day. But it is it is trying to just tweak and change as we work through. But that was that was definitely one of the feedbacks from colleagues is that it may may work uh, better for them to kind of absorb and and look at, at achieving that perhaps not in in the hours that they were trying to do their day job and I think um one of the other things that we've done and, and I talked about this earlier on is um the confidence piece and people may be taking that step into something more formal like a program we have um started some taster sessions a bit like others have already mentioned so code explorer for example um, is a number of modules that would, would cover probably a day, but it really does give individuals a chance to do a taster before signing up to the program. Um, so in, in, in essence, kind of a feeder program. So making steps into tech in small kind of bite-sized chunks more achievable. So I think through Code Explorer as well, we had um, an initial kind of uh, cohort of about 50, 58 individuals. And again, we're running that on a monthly basis with about 30, 30 people, um, which hopefully again will excite, will engage, but also encourage and really um, build that confidence for people to get more curious or to decide that they could take that next step. So I think in short, it's probably thinking about the experience for the learner. And whilst you know we want them to be able to continue their day jobs, but have a taste for what might be next or what might be to come, it's looking at how you manage that um within those kind of needs of the learner and the second one is just to create more pathways more gateways more experiences for people just to taste or to experience um tech in in, in a way that builds confidence and really uh, really is kind of encouraging and, and and inspiring that would be probably the, the two things to pull out at the moment
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Just a quick update that apparently um, Gemma Wilman is still trying to join us um, from NatWest Group. Hopefully we'll have her with us in a couple of minutes. Um, but a quick reminder to everybody to please get your questions in the Q&A box below and we'll be coming to some audience questions shortly. So we want to make sure we get the chance to cover yours. Um, so Anthony, I wanted to come um, to you next from Tech UK. Perhaps just we've heard some about some specific great programs that some of our panel are working on. Can you give us a bit more of the, the industry context of what, across what's happening, um, perhaps across the rest of the country or what, what smaller companies can do mm -hmm. to also um, try, and, uh, try and engage with some of these, some of these ideas? Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I'd start by saying that um, I, I think as a result of the pandemic, uh, you know, this has become a really significant moment um, in the evolution, I think, of of uh, of the digital economy and the digital labour market. Um, so what we're seeing uh, right across the, the country, uh, it's coming through in all of the data that's coming back, um, is over the last year, we've seen this real acceleration um, in um, organisations driving their digitisation as a result of the pandemic. Um, that was driven by the need to maintain kind of operations as we first went into lockdown. Um, but uh, but then has also uh, been accelerated by the fact that people have seen um, a real difference in the performance of organisations in terms of the extent of their digitisation over the last 12 months. And so so we um, uh, that that's a trend that's only going to be maintained. So it's, I think it's that. It's been that moment where across the economy, you know, the pennies really dropped about uh, the importance of, of organizations digitizing. So what, what that's done is that's that's massively driven the demand for digital skills. Uh, so um, as we heard uh, right at, at the beginning of the session, um, you know, the, the tech sector has been second only to um, health and social care in terms of the number of jobs it's created during the course of the pandemic. Um, and so, so we've got this kind of um, uh, uh, growing skills gap um, that we know that we have to meet in 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 completely different ways. Because with, we had a skills gap before the pandemic, um, the demand for skills has only got greater. The really exciting thing I think that we've seen uh, across the country um, in the last twelve months, though, has been um, the huge increase that we've seen in people registering and, and showing their interest in acquiring digital skills um, and um, uh, organizations like the Institute of Coding uh, seen an absolutely enormous increase in, in, in interest in people wanting to do digital um, uh, um, courses and so on to acquire digital skills uh, and this is happening right across the country so so what we have I think here um, at the start of 2021 is is a real opportunity now to think about how we build the labour market of the future um, and how we build a, um, a labour market that can support a far, far more uh, digital and digitising economy. Um, and we absolutely know, because of everything that we've learned over the last few years, about the importance of making sure that the workforce that supports that is diverse um, and, and reflects the society that... that, that businesses and organizations are seeking to serve. Um, so, so positive and exciting from that perspective, but also a moment that says, this has got to be a real call to action, I think, in terms of uh, making sure that we're doing everything that we can and we're pulling all the levers that we can, whether in government, uh, within large businesses or within, within SMEs um, to try and um, uh, meet this challenge. And for me, the, the, the number one word is pathways. Um, because um, the, the biggest challenge that we've got is this perception um, that, that digital and tech isn't for me, uh, that it's not for people with my background, it's not for people with my gender, it's not for people uh, with, uh, uh, with the kind of skills um, or educational um, uh, background that I've got. And, and that's the thing that we have to um, really work to, uh, work to challenge and, and work to address. If we look at some of the, the data in the Tech Talent Charter report, uh, you know what we're seeing is, um, uh, you know, there is there is still um, a, a significant kind of gender mismatch, um, particularly uh, when you get move further out of the southeast of England. Um, you sort of see the gender balance within companies um, uh, being kind of less equal. 
but also, um, and but interesting uh, data about, you know, if you look at the southeast, um, uh, London in the southeast, uh, you've got a higher participation from different uh, people with different uh, ethnic backgrounds, which is positive. But that level of participation is still well below what it should be if you look at the, the actual ethnic mix of the population as a whole. Um, so uh, even in the parts of the country where we might think we're doing a little bit better in terms of diversity, uh, still um, a lot more to a lot more to be done. Um, but I think the 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 exciting thing about this moment for me um, is that it that I think organisations are really starting to understand that they have to take responsibility for this. That that um, uh, and and we see this across large companies, but across small companies as, as well. Uh, which is that uh, uh, you uh, a, a real shift to um, an approach which is about how do you grow your own talent and grow your own workforce? How do you make yourself more attractive to people from more diverse uh, um, uh, backgrounds who want to come and work from you? Um, and and I think this is a, a a really really significant mind shift um, that um, you know that we're seeing uh, uh, in large companies but in small companies. But we're also fundamentally and really excitingly seeing this right across the country. Um, last year, we we did a lot of engagements with um, um, uh, tech audiences um, across the nations and regions of the UK. Uh, talent acquisition, you know, number one uh, issue. But everybody's saying that we have to own the problem. We can no longer just say that this is a, a, a challenge for government or a challenge for big business or for somebody else. This is an issue that we have to own. I think that's what's really exciting about this moment, and maybe we can talk more about uh, you know the specifics of what organisations and companies can do at the smaller end, uh, but uh, but an interesting moment, I think. Absolutely, and there's a number of things that you said there I'd love to pick up on, and I know some of our panelists have got extra points they'd like to add. But but one thing you mentioned towards the end there is for companies to really think about how they and their own organisations can change perception of tech, can be more attractive to diverse diverse talent wanting to come in. Can you give us some some tangible advice? You know, what are some really practical things companies can do if they're thinking about how they how they make their tech roles more attractive? Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, you know, think about. And, and recognize all the kind of common uh, kind of misconceptions and stereotypes about tech um, and tackle them head on, you know, talk about them, uh, talk, you know, talk about the fact that the sector is, is perceived as, as uh, you know, white, male, young, um, and that actually that that isn't the case. Um, and then uh, start to um, um, showcase role models, uh, showcase the people who, um, who are outside of those stereotypes. Um, and and from from more diverse backgrounds, people who look like me, you know, people who look like, uh, you know, people the people who can um, uh, uh, can relate to, um, and share kind of uh, authentic stories about how people have have have, um, have come into the to the sector and progressed, um, and and um, uh, make it kind of human. Um, and then I think, um, uh, but then so that's the sort of how do we change that, some of those perceptions. Uh, but also you've got to look at um, how you can uh, make sure that your organization is as is flexible as an employer. So uh, um, uh, that um, uh, you provide kind of uh, flexible employment opportunities that, that meet people's real needs and real life needs. Uh, but also demonstrate career progression. Uh, you know, what is the route through uh, uh, my organization, either uh, to more senior roles within the organization or, or if you're a small business, what are the progressions uh, that people have made outside of your business? So how have they gone on and progressed their career on the back of what they've learned and gained within your organization? Because we have to demonstrate to people that uh, uh, that you know that tech and digital roles are going to uh, give them the opportunity to pursue the lifestyles that they want to pursue. So uh, it can't, you know, we've got to demonstrate that that if you're making a you know a big bet on Okay, I'm going to retrain and and and, and try and uh, move into the tech sector. Um, that that's something that's going to be um, beneficial for you in the long term, beneficial for your family in the long term, and, and can support the kind of life that you want you you aspire for. Um, so, um, so demonstrating that kind of progression, I think, is is really imp important. Uh, lots more about kind of removing barriers to entry, making uh, job descriptions um, uh, uh, more accessible. You know, removing jargon. Um, and, and really kind of crucially, 
making it clear that you're looking for competencies as well as skills um, and, and that you're looking for life uh, for experience and transferable um, uh, 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 skills um, and, and be very clear that you're not, you know, you're not just looking for a very set narrow set of kind of coding knowledge. You know? That's a really good point. And we're definitely going to come back to that one. But Andrew, I just first I wanted to see if you um, had any builds you wanted to, to make to that. And um, given your experience, um, what have you seen companies that you've worked with do successfully in terms of making their apprenticeships, making their training programs more attractive and accessible? Yeah, I think that the key thing that really kind of stands out is we work with a huge number of organizations for, from very small organizations to, to very large organizations. And very few of them are what we would traditionally call tech industries or tech firms, but it, it pervades through every single aspect of work these days and every single aspect of social life. You know, the, the world has fundamentally changed even more so as a result of the pandemic. So, you know, I, I can sit at home order a meal to be delivered, chat to my nan on WhatsApp at the same time as filling out my tax return online, that the whole world has changed and the organizations have changed in the same way because they've had to react and, and reach their customers in different ways. So the requirements for an employer um, or for people getting into tech is changing as a result of that. You're no longer potentially looking for a, a graduate entrant or someone with GCSEs at a certain level. You're looking at someone who can use tech who can make data-driven decisions, who's aware of the risks of cyber um, attacks and phishing exercises and things like that. So the, the whole ecosystem of skills that an employer is looking for has fundamentally changed. But what hasn't changed quite so quickly is the broad spectrum of every single employer providing those skills for their employees. Um, and that's the real challenge I think we're facing here is, is understanding that tech exists in every single industry and every single employer and line manager and business almost has a responsibility and an obligation to help bring their workforces and their future workforces up to the level required and that will be required in the future. Because that's ultimately what this is all about, isn't it? It's about training and preparing for, for the future and making sure that the digital skills gap becomes smaller and the talent pool of accessible and um, capable talent becomes broader. Thank you very much. And I think um, there's two really, really interesting uh, things to think about that I think we're covering here today. Well, lots, but in terms of actually kind of uh, creating those routes, we're hearing about um, apprenticeships, finding talent out there who and thinking about their competencies, not just skills, but then also building the talent of your own workforce. Um, and we're come, going to start to come to some of the questions from, from the audience. We've had a few questions submitted already about um, a, a, on that question of, of skills. Um, how, how do you assess raw talent potential um, when the tech industry is so focused on skills? Um, I don't know if anyone in particular wanted to, to have a first crack at that question. <laughs> yes, Dan, go for it. Yeah, well, I think, you know, one of the most important skills has nothing to do with really the craft of tech. I, I would call it creative confidence. And I think creative confidence is required really in any profession. But I think particularly in tech and particularly folks trying to get into it, it's what is the level of ability and resilience to, you know, head, face head on things like imposter syndrome. And, um, and I think the workplace culture has a lot to contribute to that. So it's not just seeing if an individual has that skill. Uh, and it's actually a book about this, which I love called creative confidence, which is not just for designers. And it's a fantastic read by the founders of idea. And one of the things actually that anyone can do, to bolster that skill is to consciously get out of your comfort zone, to consciously get into a place that you kind of don't belong, but is not so far out that you feel, you know, um, totally uh, off the deep end. So what I do is I actually every week uh, go to a virtual hip hop dance class, uh, Pineapple <laughs> Studios in London, where a guy like me doesn't really kind of belong. And it's the scariest thing when I first did it, but that skill, of being comfortable with going into new territory is absolutely as important as coding or as data-driven decision-making. So I would just say, look to that cultural side of people's um, resilience as well. 
Fantastic, thank you. So I'm very happy to say now that we have been joined by Gemma Wilman from the NatWest Group, um, who has overcome some of her technical issues this morning. Um, so Gemma, I wanted to, to give you a chance to introduce yourself and also just to tell us about what you've been doing at, at um, NatWest, what's been working, what are some of the challenges you found and, and what advice you could give to some of our audience listening today. We can hear you. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm over my technical problems. Um, so just let me know if the uh, connection is, is, is good. So sorry for being so late, guys. Um, so yes, Gemma Wilman at uh, NatWest Group. I am heading up workforce enablement function within um, NatWest. And what we are looking to do is, is really start to plan for the future. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean by the fact we are wholesale looking to um, convert our bank, change our bank into a, a fintech firm with a banking license. We are wholesale trying to change um, what we do day in, day out to be wholly focused around technology, tech skills, tech skills of the future, data scientist skills, cybersecurity skills, all of the things that you would expect to see in that kind of tech sector. And what that actually means in practicality is we need some more fulfillment channels we need to really start thinking differently around how we are going to fulfill the demands that we currently have on our workforce plans for the skills of the future. Um, those skills that I've mentioned there, all of, all of which are, are critically important to us retaining our, our competitive edge and indeed making our, our, um, our bank somewhere where people want to come and work, where it's an interesting um, place to work because we're innovative, because we're at the forefront of, of technical change um, and driving forward some really interesting technical advances for our customers and indeed opportunities for our employees. So we are putting lots and lots of different fulfillment channels in place, um, looking at how we um, really bring on the, the diverse and inclusive um, groups, the, the um, society, the parts of society that perhaps are traditionally overlooked because perhaps they don't have a degree or indeed they don't have um, what we would traditionally see as a, as a set of technical um, uh, education um, and certifications that we would expect to see in a typical um, application at the bank. So um, some practical things that we're doing. Um, we are looking to work with some really, um, really interesting um, boutique, I suppose we would call them in, in, in our sort of um, industry um, groups, which I know that uh, Tech Talent Charter has got some affiliation with. So Code, Code First Girls, absolutely fantastic um, group of, of individuals trying to do something really quite different um, in this space. I know some of the other guys on the call I know have been using these for, for some time. Um, certainly, I know Vodafone and um, some of the other Goldman Sachs, et cetera, are, are, are in, that, in that space, Adam and Overy. We're really looking to try and do something different. We want to, to bring these, these, these opportunities to, to young girls. We want to be part of the revolution of changing um, and helping um, our non-tech young females move into this space. Um, and we're looking to try and really sort of generate some um, some opportunity within NatWest in that space. Similarly, Coding Black Females and Code Untapped, we're working with those guys to try and reach out to the Bain community and some of those um, uh, areas that, again, we haven't necessarily seen such a, such a big intake into our organisation. Um, we're also looking to um, really generate a, an awful lot of um, footprint, uh, footfall sorry, through our um, apprenticeships and you will have seen over LinkedIn I'm sure um, lots of activity around a lot of the apprenticeships that we're trying to to really booster into the organization we have specific graduate uh, training programs within um, our organization around technology but actually what we're looking to do and I heard someone mention earlier around skills you know it's not good enough just to to look to the market to provide a software engineer. What we need to understand now is the specific skills that we need associated to particular pieces of technology and banking technology and go after those, those specific mm -hmm. skills within the marketplace, training young, young folks up into those, into those skills. And I should add, it's not just the young folks. We're actually looking at 
people who are returning to work. We're looking at guys in our call centers, in our customer service areas that, you know, in the not too distant future, I'm sorry to say, may well, you know, have and find themselves, you know, with redundant tasks, tasks that have been automated or augmented. And so what we're looking to do is get ahead of the game, get ahead of the curve and start to understand what is the reskilling programs that we need to put in place in the organization to look at those skills to look at those guys in those those spaces and see someone mentioned uh, assessments earlier not only from a technical perspective but from an aptitude perspective you know are they looking to to stay within the bank and if they are do they want to be part of those future skills and if so let's get them through those those training those training courses those reskilling courses and actually those are the people with the real core banking knowledge, with the real core customer facing roles, the, 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 the knowledge that people, if you like, in HQ just don't have, the experience that they just don't have, that would be phenomenal then brought back into the organization to build the, the very tech that they will have been dealing with on a verbal face to face basis. So we're making that a priority within our, within our organization. Um, and you will have seen, and I'll pause in a second, you will have seen, um, I'm, just, I'm just late to the party. So Too many things I want to pick trying up to, on. Trying to, get it all out, trying to get it all out, guys, trying to get it all out. So, um, and you will have seen some, some stuff um, from NatWest um, with regards to, to the food bank that we sort of loaned out our, our big Goga Burn um, um, premises to when we were in the first lockdown to, to try and provide food um, to some of the poor poor poorer um, parts of society in, in, in um, Edinburgh. And you may say, what on earth has that got to do with tech and coding and, and that sort of thing? Well, actually what happened was we ended up talking and liaising with some really good partners at that point, um, some of the Deloitte's and the KPMG's and, and looking at some of the, the charities and some of the smaller businesses up in um, Edinburgh. And actually what we've established is a, is a community where we can actually start to offer our skills out to um, the, the community and some of our partners and some of our small businesses and small enterprises up there um, by way of, you know, um, a skills bank almost and delivering skills to the to the community and helping to do that, um, you know, that 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 sort of do good, feel good type yeah. um, approach in, in the community by upskilling and reskilling. Fantastic. So I'm going to pull, pull, pull there. Hopefully that was enough information in a short space of time for being left. No, that, that, was, that was fantastic. And I think lots of incredible, incredibly innovative ideas there and lots of incredible work. But I think I want to spend just a couple more minutes um, with the panel on looking externally for new talent, kind of how, how do you find that? And then I really want to come back to some of the things um, that Kirsty was talking about and that Dan was talking about in terms of kind of upskilling your existing team and providing new opportunities to people within the organization. Um, but I wanted to, um, you mentioned um, there, Gemma, some, some actual specific organizations you're working with to help you find that talent externally. And mm. a reminder that um, on the Tech Talent Charter website, we have, um, we, we map a lot of these organizations as well. Um, but Anthony, I wanted to ask if you had anything you could build on um, in terms of where people should look, you know, say say they, they've, they've got their case studies, they've got their, program ready to go, how do they get it out there? How do they find people to actually start engaging with the organization and get involved in these initiatives? <laughs> um, well, Tech Talent Charter is a great place to start. Um, thank you, thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, and, and I think, um, look, there are, um, you know, I, th I, think, I think as soon as you start to engage in the debate, seriously and as soon as soon as you start to really explore um uh some of these issues and think about uh you know what is your strategic plan as an organization for how you are going to make sure you've got the skills and talent you need in a labor market that is going to become more competitive and much more um uh it's going to be more challenging to to retain your best people uh, because the market for for them is 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 going to be uh, you know very dynamic. Um, so you so how do you, how do you think st strategically about talent as as a core asset for your business? Um, uh, and then and then you start to think about how uh, uh, you know what you can learn from what's happening out there. You very quickly find out there's a huge network of people and organisations who have uh, who are engaged in these issues and are thinking them through. Um, so 
I, I, don't, I don't think it's difficult to find the find the potential partners, um, but but it all starts from being really committed to the problem and, and recognizing the problem and, and recognizing that you need to address it. Um, there are, uh, I, I, I think that the biggest challenge that we have you know, across the UK in this area is is probably just fragmentation. Um, and, and, you know, there are so many initiatives. Um, how, how do you work out which is the right one um, uh, to engage with? I think that's a bit of an issue. One of the, the challenges that we're focused on specifically as an organization um, is the question of, of, uh, of accreditation of skills, um, of skills courses and training. Um, we, we've uh, we, um, have recently brought uh, an organization called Tech, um, uh, Tech um, Partnership uh, uh, in, into our organization um, that uh, does work accrediting uh, degree courses. Uh, but also um, um, uh, degree apprenticeships. Um, and, and, and we think that there's a specific piece of work to do there to, to how do we make sure that we kind of accredit skills providers um, so that uh, employers kind of have that level of confidence that says, yeah, okay, this is a good organization to go with because they're already accredited uh, by, uh, by the industry in a way that I think, you know, um, I feel kind of comfortable with. Uh, but uh, so I think that that kind of kind of accreditation and, and confidence and trust bit is one of the bits that we've got to get right over the over the sort of uh, you know the fairly, fairly short period ahead uh, if we're going to help people uh, tackle this challenge. Fantastic, thank you. And I want to start coming to some questions um, that we've had in from the audience um, on some of these topics. Um, and you mentioned um, apprenticeships there again, Anthony, and we've had some questions around that. And, um, some of those questions are around how can smaller companies take advantage of apprenticeships, um, perhaps when they, they don't have the resources of some larger companies or they can't necessarily afford to have less productive or non-billable staff. Um, Andrew, can you help us with them, um, with how they might tackle that challenge? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's a common misconception that apprenticeships are hugely labour intensive and, and the reality is on the ground, they're, they're often not. There, there is a degree of learner accountability. There is a requirement to integrate training into the role. Um, and that's kind of set at, at 20 percent off the job training, which is probably the the most poorly described aspect of apprenticeships because it's done on the job and it's result and it's directly related to a learner acquiring new skills to increase their capability in the workplace. So it shouldn't be seen as a challenge that was going to make staff less protect less productive. The reality is it's actually an investment in their future, um, an investment in them as individuals to create new capabilities, to enhance productivity and to create better efficiencies. So so actually they'll probably spend five to 10% in formal training in classroom environments or live virtual environments. And then they'll spend time doing new stuff that, that their employer needs them to do, learning new things. So that 20% is described as new skills acquisition and then practical application of that skills in the workplace doing their job. So it's a really great opportunity to, to progress um, and you know, I started my own apprenticeship last October, right, um, 41, um, so kind of in the middle of hopefully my career um, and have learned a huge amount. Now, I would say I probably spend 30 percent of my time in work doing new things or doing things for the first time or having new conversations, all of which will count towards my off the job training as part of my program and personal development. So it's a real opportunity. And I, I think for organizations to get over that initial hesitation that it's going to create challenge rather than opportunities is a really important first step and um, because it's applicable for every single individual in, in their workforce whether it's entry level talent joining level two or three programs whether it's high performing execs on invite only mba programs or msc qualifications or or whether it's kind of the middle ground the perceived i think one of our questions called it the forgotten middle well, there's there's level four programs, there's level five programs, there's apprenticeships for almost every single job role out there um, that can really complement and support an individual. The challenge with apprenticeships is less about the training than the fact the individual has to be in a job role directly related to that training. So it's often better complemented with 
other training methodologies or supporting digital content because it won't be right for every individual, but it will be right for every organization. Thank you. Lots of fantastic advice there. But Kirsty, I wanted to come back to you because um, it, it may be that there are some people watching us today who really want to get programs like this going within their own organization. But how do they persuade their senior team that this is a good idea and something that the company should be investing in? Yeah, um, so I was listening to, to kind of Gemma with interest as well. And I think for us at Nationwide, we've very much looked at um, tech and our tech strategy, but um, have taken it as an addition to our organization's purpose. So we very much see um, tech as having purpose, but our purpose is still mutuality. So, um, you know, we're not a tech organization. We are a building society that serves, you know, the me members across, uh, across the UK. And we very much want to be here for our members in another 200 years time albeit how we serve members will look and feel really differently from you know 200 years ago as it as it does today so for us kind of tech with purpose building it into the organizational tapestry has been really important at the same time as recognizing that capabilities that we need for the future the service and the capabilities that our members will demand of us clearly shift every day. And therefore, as an organisation and as colleagues, we do need to respond to that. But I think for us, that's really important in terms of, of the investment or the need for the programmes is it's very much still rooted in our heritage, very much rooted in our purpose, but realising that we need to respond as we look to kind of build, build society more broadly. And we have to whether it's about inclusion or diversity or whether it's about tech skills, we clearly have to represent or be representative of the members that we serve. So we have to be able to have digital skills. We have to be uh, diverse in terms of day interactions. So it is really part of the purpose and the very heritage that Nationwide has. And we're building on that. And I think that's really important, not only influencing senior leaders in the organization but also in terms of encouraging colleagues to take the steps to reskill because what people come and join us for and what people stay with nationwide for is very much the purpose it's very much the culture that was mentioned earlier it's a very special place to work but we do need to develop our skills and capabilities um, accordingly so it's it's holding on to that purpose but realizing that we need that different capability. And I think that influences senior leaders in terms of being relevant for the future, your business model being sustainable, but also you do want your colleagues to still stay and be inspired by purpose, albeit they may be doing a very different role in a different different way moving forward. And that's as relevant for our, um, our branch staff and for our contact centres as it is for individuals really working in engineering or in kind of cloud or in data science. So. Um, hanging on to that organisational purpose, but looking at how to kind of fulfil expectations and forward has been, has been key for us. Um, just, sorry, just to respond on um, that kind of middle layer as well, we are very much looking at uh, leadership programmes that focus around, um, focus around digital as well. So not only upskilling uh, knowledge around our leaders, but also facing into some of that pastoral care, I think, um, that was mentioned earlier as well. So uh, very much segmenting the workforce around not only the skills, but also the mindset and behaviours that leaders need to really work in this in this environment and a leadership new era as we're talking to. Thank you. There's been another question um, that, that sort of I've been looking at while you've been talking that I wanted to throw at you as well on this. Um, why do people frown on boot camps and non-university trained graduates? Um, is that something that you've experienced as part of the programmes you've been running at Nationwide, Kirsty? Um, I don't know. I don't know about the frowning. Uh, it's, 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 <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know about the, I don't know about the frowning. Look, I think... Um, it goes back to what was what was said earlier. I think um, your mechanisms for either developing or bringing in talent to your organisation have to very much be 
embedded in what the strategy is, but also what the culture of the organisation is. And therefore, um, it depends then how to structure those programmes or those those interventions. Um, you know, we, we, we do and we have run boot camps. I, I don't believe they've been uh, frowned upon. But again, even the construct of the boot camp could look and feel very different from organisation to organisation. And I think as long as it's tethered in your values, um, in what you want the outcomes to be, then um, one would hope that, you know, any any learning intervention would be a positive experience as opposed to something that, uh, that would uh, be frowned upon or be negative. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Um, Andrew, I'd love to know if you've um, you've seen any of the organisations you've worked with struggle with this problem as well. I have, and it's it's not so much at an organisational level. I don't think it's departments within those organisations who have a little bit of, dare I say it, snobbery. Just old fashioned. We need a graduate. They need to come from a red brick university, and we can't take anyone without a almost that full realization of skills and learning capability that, that they expect from those institutions, which which is difficult and it's challenging to overcome as organisations try to change their recruitment practices to be more accessible and to attract a more a, a broader audience. But I think what's really interesting in this space is what's likely to happen in the future. Now that digital apprenticeships are so well established in some employer ecosystems, what's actually going to be more valuable three or four years from now? Is it going to be a standalone degree from a red brick or Russell brick or Russell Group University, or is it going to be a digital and tech degree alongside work experience in the likes of organisations like our, our, our other panellists here or, or Accenture or CGI, or those some of the organisations who have been running programmes for a long time? And I think arguably you'll get to a point where the landscape shifts completely the other way and people will say, look, we want you to have a degree, but we really want you to have a degree apprenticeship that's backed up with this volume of work experience in sector so that we can put you on a level seven degree apprenticeship program and progress you even further in our employer and in our industry. So I think the landscape will completely change. I think boot camps also will become much, much more popular in the same way that a lot of organisations um, that we've already heard from on the panel and, and more broadly are using organizations like leadership through, through sport like STEMETs and code first girls like um, generation um, young professionals to create capability at a really young age to go through the boot camps and establish the entry level talent so that when they go into employment they already know what they're doing it, it's kind of becoming a, a natural course and a route that on an organizational level we're all aspiring to but on an individual department level, we still need to do some work and education to to overcome some of those those myths. Well, um, Gemma, let's hear from you on how you have addressed this in NatWest. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I'm um, you know I I would echo what's um what you just said there about the the snobbery snobbery thing. I think you know let's be frank and blunt. You know, to date and for a very long time, that's been the minimum standard to get into the financial services. You have to have a degree. Um, and that was that was the entry into financial services. And I think to my point earlier about actually this is us now spinning things on its head and and actually saying that this is technology with a banking industry with a bank with a banking license. This is this is about tech and innovation and curiosity. And from from that perspective, actually, what we want is a is a hybrid is a is a is a big mix of different types of people so that we have a hotbed of innovation. And, and yes, we will still want people and do still want people into the, to the organization from, from red bricks because they bring a certain way of thinking. But actually, we're also really keen um, and explicitly opening the doors to make sure that we've got people from, as I say, different backgrounds um, with different experience, you know, and things, innate human capabilities, you know, such as, the use of their imagination, empathy, curiosity, resilience, creativity, all these words that we're, we're familiar with, but actually putting some assessments and some tests and some ways of interviewing so that we can draw that out to see if we've got um, people who have that, not necessarily the, the skills and the things that can be taught um, from, a, from a tech perspective, but actually if they have that innate human capability that we want to foster within the organization in the first instance, and then we can put them on some of our, our, our training courses, our, our um, specific skilling um, courses. So what we're looking for is, you know, do you have that innate human capability? Do you have that um, curiosity, that, 
that sense making, that critical thinking, that emotional intelligence, you know, that will bring that hotbed of innovation to the organization. Um, yeah. And that doesn't mean that you necessarily have a university degree because that's structured in a way, in, in a learning, st structured learning environment, which doesn't necessarily lend itself to that, you know, um, um, way of thinking. Thank you, um, Dan. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to build on this, but there's been another question which is looking at this problem from a slightly different angle, not specifically around university education, but around those existing tech skills. Um, so the question is, what advice can you give to small tech companies that have massive hardwired views about bringing in tech only talent, not more diverse talent to train or retrain? And I'm gonna slightly build on that. I'm gonna using my facilitator's privileges um, just to build on something that Gemma just said um, in terms of looking for those other aptitudes. If you're, if you're trying to address these sort of prejudices or hardwired opinions within a small organization, how do you then assess those, those aptitudes that you're looking for if they're not kind of tech qualifications? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's interesting. Some of the panelists address this, that particularly in tech, we have these very strange origin stories and mythologies about what tech is about and who's in it and who's supposed to be in it and what's, what does success look like? And you know, being in Silicon Valley for 10 years, seeing places like uh, 500 Startups or Y Combinator or these places that are trying to spark the next generation of you know, tech innovators. If any of you guys watch Silicon Valley on HBO, I don't know if you get that here. Anyway, it's like very much that programmer kind of very kind of left-brained, aggressive, male, white kind of thing. But actually, when you think about the success rate of some of those, that style of program, you know, nine out of 10 of those fail. And the, and the kind of teams that start to emerge are ones that you can just see are much more inclusive and holistic. Um, Airbnb, you know, their co-founders actually went to Rhode Island School of Design and are designers and had a, an insight into how there can be a sharing economy connection to homes that maybe that, you know, very narrow, Hard, hardcore, hardwired kind of tech view would have missed. Now, if we have a hard time struggling against the perceptions, and I don't know what Silicon Roundabout is like, and I know that's only London, it just seems like a massive construction zone over there, but I, I think those perceptions probably are here too. I think you can also appeal to the left brain of organizations that diverse teams, whether it's a small startup or a large company, they outperform their peers. There are places that are more welcoming. You have higher employee engagement. And I mean, as a designer, I just, I think this is kind of maybe known to those that are um, kind of in this, in that space, that the best way to get amazing idea is to get a lot of ideas and to actually consciously fail and prototype and iterate. And so I think that um, that perception is starting to shift. And I think that uh, I'm not hearing as much about these companies that are just focusing on just hardcore tech talent and nothing else. And I think we're starting to realize that companies are best when they actually serve society in more creative and, uh, you know, dare I say, human ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I want to take some more questions from um, the audience now. We've just had um, one in. Um, as a tiny company creating a junior role, so a young black female bootcamp coder can get experience, is there any financial help we can access to boost the salary we can offer? I don't know whether, Anthony, you had um, any helpful advice on, on that front. Uh, I mean, I think the, um, you know, you know, the, the, the apprenticeship incentive is probably the the you know the the, the one route there that that, that um, companies should explore you know to what extent can they can they use that as a way to um, uh, uh, helping them uh, cover some of the costs of bringing those young people in um, so I think that's the best one I could I could suggest okay thank you um, fantastic well I really want to as we're kind of 
almost almost getting to the point where we're, we're going to start um, wrapping up, um, taking any last questions. I wanted to just recap on some of the things that, that I think I've heard today and really ask our panel if there's anything, anything we've missed, anything else we need to kind of add in that, that we want people to take away with them. I think what we've heard, first of all, first and foremost, is that it's really important to get your strategy right and your culture, you know, prepare the environment for, for creating these training um, and apprenticeship programs. Um, then looking at how you can make your your organization and your roles um, more attractive to the kind of people you're looking to recruit and we've heard about some specific organizations that, that you can use to, to help go out and, and do that we've heard about um, code first girls and, and coding black females and again a reminder to everyone that you can find more of those on the tech talent charter website um, then we've also heard about how you create the right support structures within your existing teams um, managing resource so you're not expecting um, already time poor people to, to pick up mentorship roles or to pick up um, program management but, but create the additional resource um, internally and then also we've heard about measuring the success of what you do. Um, have I have I missed anything panel is there anything else that, that companies should be thinking about um, or any specific advice you can um, you can give them on where they should start to kick off this whole process throwing that one open to the floor. I'm happy to add in a, a quick thought on that. First, that's all right. Um, I think one of the things that we've started to work with with a couple of employers recently is actually kind of looking backwards to understand where to go forwards. And, and that starts with a real evaluation of previous recruitment and hiring practices spanning over the last four or five years and, and looking at the type of individuals they've brought into the business and what they're doing now. How have they progressed? Have they progressed? Um, and what we found rather alarmingly is that a huge percentage of employees that were recruited three or four years ago are doing the same jobs that they were doing. They haven't progressed. They haven't moved forward. And some of them are broadly happy with that. But really, that that's kind of highlighted a need to provide more training, to develop more capabilities, because the roles are going to change. And I think the Open University did a study, I think, last year or maybe late 2019, that suggested 12 million jobs in the UK would change over the next five years as a result of increased in tech and automation and, and skills affiliated with technical developments and advancements. So it, it's really, I, I can't stress the importance of needing to, to kind of look at how those roles are evolving and, and embedding now the capabilities and the skill sets they'll need to, to avoid the mass disruption that, that that amount of technological change could cause to, to employer workforces. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Gemma, did you have any, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a couple of things I would say. And, and people today are looking much more than ever for purpose. You know, what am I doing and why am I doing it? So for, for the smaller companies and indeed for, for the teams, you know, and the, the, the people who are heading up teams, it's, it's really important to make sure that when you're looking to recruit, um, new um, folks into the organization or indeed retrain folks within the organization. It's not just simply about a job anymore or, you know, coming to work to do a spe specific set of tasks. You know, it has to be clear what they are doing in order to make a difference. What value are they adding to the company, to the consumers, to the customers, whatever it may be. So whenever we talk about the roles, or the broader um, organization, we make absolute sure now that it's clear how this role is going to make a difference to what we are doing within the organization and the broader customer base, employee base, or community base. Mm -hmm. Must talk about purpose. So make tech part of your purpose and make innovation at the core of all of your thinking. And I think in that case, people get excited about the future and what value that they can really bring to that. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that really builds on several of the things we've heard some of the panelists say, including um, Kirsty's point about kind of building it into your organisational purpose, getting that culture right and the environment right first before you just sort of plough ahead. Um, Anthony, um, I know you wanted to jump in here with with a, a closing. Yeah. Point. Well, just 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 last point, point really about kind of coming back to the context uh, of, the, of this discussion, because, uh, you know, we're we've had a year of this uh global pandemic, if, if there was ever a moment where everybody's thinking that it feels like the world has changed and and as we think and look forward to um, getting to the other side of the pandemic, I think everybody's thinking that 
uh, you know, the future is going to be different to the world that, that we left behind. So, which I think is a, a, a great moment to provoke us all to uh, to reflect um, and to think about what that new world is going to be like. Um, what we're seeing as Tech UK uh, is that, um, you know, across public and private sector, there is this absolute recognition now and understanding um, that digital and tech is going to play a far, far more significant role uh, in, in the future. And that uh, if you want to be successful as a, an organization, you have to be able to um, take advantage of, of, of digital and tech as best you possibly can. Um, but the other thing I think that sits alongside that is that technology is simply a set of tools. Um, and the thing that is really going to make a difference is your people and your culture um, and your ability to marry these two things together, to marry together the technology and, and, and the people who are going to drive uh, the use of that technology to, to, to drive the outcomes of, that your organization is trying to mm -hmm. achieve. Um, so, so I think it's a moment for everybody to reflect much, much more about strategically as an organization, what's your plan for digital, what's your plan for tech, and what's your plan for people and culture, and how are you going to marry those, th those two things together? And I think they're going to be the big competitive differentiators for the decade ahead. I think that is a perfect time, um, perfect point to wrap this up on. Um, thank you very much to all of our panellists today for sharing their experiences and their insights and their advice for everybody listening. Um, I've taken a huge amount of notes myself, so it's hugely appreciated. Um, and on that note, I am going to hand back to um, Debbie. Thank you and well done. I hope what you heard today gives you both some practical strategies and also the mindset to step forward in this. You know, if you think of the start of the, of the discussion that we had, our tech needs for talent have in no way slowed. What we actually saw in the last year is that exponential growth, not just because I think as us as a tech industry continue to need more and more great people, but also the last year showed us, as you know, Anthony was alluding to, every company woke up and realized they are at their heart still going to need to be a digital company. They need those tech skills. It has been a year of incredible upheaval. We know how many people have been displaced in their jobs, have been thrown off that ladder through no fault of their own. So many people have woke up to realize how vulnerable their job is. This is where we can take the great displacement that has happened, the great pain that we're feeling across the UK, and to bring it together with tech's great need. We've heard again and again, we need the talent, we need the diversity, we need to build the inclusion and the belonging to bring people in. This is something that we need everyone to lean into. This is something that no single organization can fix on their own. So if you are new to this space and your company is not yet thinking about it, please go back to, I'd say go back to your office, go back to your next Zoom call and bring this up. Think about how you could think about different ways of bringing people into your tech workforce. And remember what we heard today, this isn't just looking outside your office walls. This is about looking inside your internal workforce. How can you take those great skills and deep knowledge of your company and by reskilling them, put that to work to do some amazing things within your, your organization. If you're new and you're getting that motivation, remember you don't have to start from scratch. You can listen to talks like this. You can go to our open playbook. Please know that we know there's huge appetite around things like apprenticeships. So our open playbook is not a static piece of information. It grows bi-monthly. We know one of the big themes that is going to be coming up is around apprenticeships. We saw that some of the questions happening. We expand our playbook through something called hack sessions. We will be holding some hackathons around apprenticeship. So if you are someone who has expertise in this area and want to share how companies can figure this out, please join us for those hackathons. If you're someone who wants to learn about these things, come to the working lunches that will come after and return to the playbook. Remember the playbook 
the hackathons, the, um, the toolkit, and our directory. Remember, we take our partners. We've mapped hundreds of initiatives, looking at retraining, returning, et cetera, where you can find things that are happening, not just at a national level, but to go in and to search what is happening in Scotland, what is happening in the Northwest, what can you dip into to reach this talent? You heard today as well that we need to look and think differently when we are attracting and growing these women. One way to do that is to hear from them yourself. So if you've not signed up before, I'd encourage you to join us this afternoon. We last autumn ran a campaign, a really successful campaign called Doing It Anyway, that encouraged women from across the sector who found an alternate way in, who came in through one of these routes to tell their story blown away that even in our first call, we had over 300 women telling us their stories of how they got into tech. We chose eight and launched a great campaign. This afternoon for our working lunch, you can hear from three of these women who came from very different backgrounds to find their way into tech. Now, if you're an SME, and I'm always addressing you as my SMEs and my startups, if you're thinking, how do I do this? Tune in for this session. When we ask these women, what's the advice you'd give employers? They've got some cracking ideas on how you could find women just like them. And it doesn't take huge budgets. It doesn't take a massive DNI department or an HR department to do it. There are some actionable things that you can do right now to find those people and bring them into your organization. So if you haven't filled in the poll, please do so. And we're also putting in the Q&A window now a link to our survey. Tell us how this went. What did you like? What did you not like? What do you want to hear more about? We really need this conversation. The Tech Talent Charter is about bringing people together, connecting, convening, and amplifying our messages. So we need you part of that. And oh, did I mention, if you haven't joined, what are you waiting for? Resistance is futile. We're now over 550 companies, organizations from across the whole of the UK, every sector, every size, coming together to really move the dial on inclusion and diversity in tech. We'd love to have you be one of those. You can find out more information below. So two sessions less. Join us for that working lunch to hear from the women. This evening, if you've been thinking, annoyed all week, but Debbie, you're not talking about schools. You've got to fix what's happening in schools. But what about universities? That retraining, you know, half my tech workforce don't even know how to use tech. We've got the people you need to hear from this evening and a summary of the week. So thank you for joining me for the morning coffee. It's our last one. And thank you for joining us for our first Flexi Festival. Amazing work from my panel and from Rebecca. I hope most of you, all of you, can join us for lunch today. Bye.